Welcome to the Want to Learn Podcast. I'm your host, Francis Tapon. In this episode, I interview Ladan Hiracek, who is the host of of the Travel Wisdom Podcast. You've heard of Wander Learn. Well, how about Travel Wisdom? Similar concept. He and I sit down and talk about, well, a variety of subjects, and it's a wide-ranging conversation. I want to take this moment also to thank all my patrons at patreon.com slash ftapon. Go there and get some sweet rewards for as little as $2 a month. It is definitely worth it. You'll get chapters of my book as I write them. You'll get other rewards as you pay more. My favorite reward is the $25 reward because you get $300 of gifts that you want for Christmas. So sign up for the $25 reward and get $300 worth of gifts that you would probably buy at Amazon or wherever anyway. So it's the best deal out there and you're helping support this podcast at the same time. It's a total win-win. Check it out. Patreon.com slash ftapon. My name is Ladin Yunacek. I am the host of the Travel Wisdom Podcast, which is about how travel is more than a vacation, but a learning experience. So yeah, I've been to like, I don't know, 100 countries. I've really saw travel as, you know, kind of investment into, you know, what I was doing, what I was learning. And so I would, you know, travel during my summers in um, in university. And basically, I was bribed to do that by my mom. She's like, oh, you know, don't do the summer semester that you're just gonna be working too hard. Here, I'll buy you a flight wherever you want to go. And then, you know, you can go travel. And so I did exactly that. And it was an amazing time. I decided to go to Russia, then Greece, then Western Europe. And I, you know, invited a friend of mine. I'm just like, hey, man, do you want to go with me to Russia? And uh, he said, yes. And that kind of started this, you know, amazing thing. But, you know, another another big thing that really kind of spurred it on or made it possible in, in the future as well, because that was for a month. Um, but, you know, had we not found uh, homestays or, you know, something like couch surfing or um, hospitality club, then, you know, that wouldn't have been possible because that literally cut our costs on the ground in half. And, you know, I'm a cheap guy. And also on top of that, at the time I was a student. So it's just like, okay, I, I need to travel as much as possible. And that, you know, the homestays really improved things because it also, you know, allowed you to see what things were like, you know, from a local perspective. And so basically you would stay with a family or a person or, you know, whatever, somebody your age, and you'd see local parties, local things, local shops, everything like this. And so it was almost like having family and friends, you know, in a certain area. So that was really cool. And, and so, you know, just kind of kept traveling, went to Africa, the Middle East, Asia, um, you know, Southeast Asia, all these, all these different types of places. And I always saw it like, you know, it was pretty expensive. And, and a lot of people were just kind of like, wow, you're, you must be super rich uh, to be able to do this. But, you know, I, I basically did it as you know cheap as possible, but still it was very expensive. But I saw it as an investment in my future. I saw it as a way to kind of um, you know become wiser, actually. And then after a while, people were saying like, hey, you should write a book. And I'm like, I really don't want to write a book, but I can talk. And uh, I'd love to have you know, people on a podcast and I love podcasts at the time. So, okay, I'll start a podcast. What Ooh. year was this? By I the think way? this was five years ago now. I think, I think it's been going on for five, mm-hmm. maybe even six years. I, I don't even remember. <laughs> when you started it, then all of a sudden you, you, you realize your passion is, wow, this is a great way to merge my, my, my desire to kind of communicate with people as well as podcast. Yeah. Basically it gave me an excuse to talk to really interesting people that I have no uh, right or no um, reason to be talking to, but they're like, okay, you know, oh, oh, you want to talk for an hour? No. Oh, you want to talk for an hour and you're going to share it with, you know, your audience? Okay, let's do that. And so it was kind of like yeah, a hack. Yeah. <laughs> it is funny how that works. Yeah. <laughs> it's still a hack. Yeah. It's so true. And then very soon afterwards, like six months afterwards, I uh, got deported from Germany. <laughs> so I'd finished my okay, master's. We got to hear that story. Yeah. Come on, give us the story. I, I finished my master's. and uh, and but, but during my master's, I'd gone to India to do my master's thesis, like the, the actual work, you know, to, to earn the master's. And uh, while I was there, my, my German visa expired, but I'm like, oh, I don't care. I'm in, I'm in India right now. And then came back and you know you you still get like a you know visa on arrival to europe and but then the the date for the thesis defense was basically like the the presentation like it kept getting moved back so i ended up having to wait like four months to do the presentation so i was waiting for four months to like because i didn't have like a you know half hour presentation done um but yeah finally got that done went into the you know uh, foreigner's office to get like a 
18 month job searching visa, which I was entitled to and, uh, you know, couldn't shut up. And then, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I came back from India, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, like, wait, when did you come back? Oh, that was in that was in December. Oh, shoot. That means you've been here for four months and you're only allowed to be here for three months in any six month period. And so I'm like, fuck. So I went from like, hey, I'm going to get a, you know, 18 month job searching visa to I'm going to be deported within a span of about three minutes. And um, yeah, so they said like, okay, you have like one week to leave and then you can come back. So, you know, no fees or anything like this or no no fines. So that that was that actually ended up really well. You know, I, I was able to come back, but uh, they probably expected me to go to back to the U.S., but I'm like, I'm going to go to Siberia. And, uh, you know, I'd wanted to learn Russian. And uh, so I traveled across Siberia on the, you know, Trans-Siberian Railway and, uh, you know, spent three months there, got pretty good at Russian. And, um, yeah, then came back. So in the middle of Siberia, I also went to a work camp. And there I did some labor on the work camp where I had picked up, you know, some trash on the beach, uh, you know, voluntarily. But I like to say in the end that Germany sent me to a Siberian labor camp. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what a ridiculous, ridiculous story. With regard to, you know, kind of like looking at the future and you're looking at the United States and you're looking at these countries, is there a pr- particular place that you say, wow, I would love to to live there or this is where I think the future is going to be or any thoughts of or do you do you worry that, uh, you know, the United States is in decline? Uh that, you know, things are going to go hell in a handbasket, which by the way, people have been saying that ever since the Vietnam War. I mean, it's been a recurring theme. Um, but at some point, obviously, somebody will be right. At some point, the United States will have a very strong uh, decline, just like all empires have always had such a decline. What is your kind of uh, big picture of that topic? Basically, this guy, Peter Zihan, Zihan, um, he he actually just came out with a book um, like a month or two ago, Disunited Nations, and it's his, it's his third book. The other one is Accidental Superpower and Absent Superpower. So basically what he's arguing is, um, okay, so U.S. is like, why am I paying? Why am I paying for half of the world's, you know, military? Why am I paying to keep shipping right. lanes open, you know, in Saudi Arabia or, you know, the Strait of Malacca in, in Malaysia? Like, why? Like, that's that's really expensive to do that. And uh, so after a while, when it doesn't need to anymore, it's going to be like, okay, I'm not going to anymore. And, you know, the reason we, we spend so much on the, the military is because uh, and, and, and that so few other people spend, you know, any reasonable amount on the military like Germany, like they don't have a military, like it's really it's in- inconsequential, like if they actually had to do something, they, they couldn't. Um, so basically, once that vacuum of power happens, there's going to be all these um, uh, basically pirates and and, you know, people are going to start scuffling I mean, the, the regional regional wars, regional, you know, uh, issues and everything like this, because the, the U.S. is going to be like, I don't care. Like, who cares what's going on between, you know, Taiwan and China or, you know, Afghanistan and Pakistan? Like, I don't like I don't care. Uh, you know, Iran and Saudi Arabia, like. I don't care if they're having a war like that's not part of my thing. It, like if it doesn't affect oil and it doesn't affect us. And and um, so basically, yeah, like the world, he argues that the world is going to hell in a handbasket and the U.S. is going to be the only one that's like they're pretty good and they're self-sufficient everywhere. Everywhere else is going to have like increase in regional wars, uh, decrease in like resources. They don't have all the things that they need to have a you know functioning economy to have a you know happy populace, but the U.S. does. And so, of all of them, you know, and the U.S. has its problems and everything like this, but it doesn't even have to be uh, that good because it just has everything that it needs. So basically, um, you know, I've seen this as like the U.S. is life or government or you know a country on easy mode, <laughs> and everywhere else is like it's on hard mode or super hard or legendary, you know. And so they gotta they gotta deal with the, the same problems, but like we we just kind of have have a pass at a lot of things. So, um, yeah, he argues that the U.S. is very stable. And, um, you know, I would kind of echo this. And I wasn't, you know, very happy about coming back to the U.S. Uh, I'm, I'm living in Florida now, have been for two years. And, uh, you know, I, I really didn't want to go back. I wanted to stay in Germany, but I couldn't find a job. I Well, I could have found a job and I did find a job, but, you know, whatever issues. And then but I, I realized, like, I know what I want to do. And there's almost nobody that's doing exactly what I want to do in Germany or in generally in Europe. And uh, in U.S., there's like, well, okay, so so I, that's not exactly true. There's maybe three places that do what I want to do in Europe. But in the U.S., it's like 15 places. And there's just so much more money. It's just so much better. And, you know, so I kind of came to this realization, like, shoot, I mean, honestly, like, 
there's just so much more money. There's just so much more opportunities in the U.S. And I'm not happy to say this. I, I would be the last person to say this, but like, I think that's the best place. Like, honestly, I think the U.S. is, and I think it'll remain that way. I think it's going to like be even more and more powerful, relatively speaking, compared to the other places because they're they're just going to go to hell in a handbasket. I think. Mike did say that he thinks that Canada will be even better just because it has all that extra land and a slow population density. And so he, he was mentioning that, at least on my podcast. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've talked about this as well. Um, you know, I, I kind of I kind of see both ways. Uh, Canada and the U.S., they are, you know, very good allies. So honestly, like if one's doing OK, like if Canada when Canada main, re- remains an ally of the U.S., then, then it's definitely good. If it ever became an enemy, then um you know that then it would definitely not have a good time but uh, yeah i think i think uh, mike is right that that a high population is going to be a liability especially if universal basic income happens uh which you know in the us right now with coronavirus it looks like it it might and uh people will be like oh shoot every person we bring in literally costs us this much money per per year oh man that's going to get that's going to get expensive <laughs> Speaking about the coronavirus, I guess we got to bring that up. <laughs> How are you dealing with it in Florida? Yeah, um, it's it's going well. Uh, like, you know, South Florida. I'm not in South Florida. I'm not in Miami. I'm in North Florida. Uh, University of Florida, Gainesville, uh, close to Orlando, Tampa, uh, Jacksonville. Um, yeah, I mean, we're doing good. Actually, our county has only had, as of, you know, this recording, which is April 30th, uh, it's only had like 200 cases and two deaths. So it's kind of like, you know, I'm kind of like, well, this is ridiculous. Why are we shutting everything down for two deaths? One of which was a 78-year-old grandma, which is kind of like, okay, like we shouldn't do – I mean, we wouldn't shut down all the roads if somebody had like a fatal bicycling accident or something like this. We wouldn't shut it down for a month. So, you know, this is this is kind of ridiculous. Um, but, you know, so so I'm, I'm personally doing fine. How about you? It's a tough question because on the one hand, People can say, and, and I'm with you on that, which is like, wow, look at the amount of deaths we have in, in worldwide. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's less than a, a flu year so far. I mean, it's like 250,000, something like that, a quarter million, which is a, uh, an average flu year kills more than that. So in that sense, the flip side is to say, okay, but there's no parallel universe. We don't know how many deaths there would have been had we not sheltered in place. So would have, maybe there would be... A hundred times more deaths, or maybe there would only be twice as many deaths. I, you know, it's hard for me, at least, to know for sure. Uh, I'm no expert to to know like what that parallel universe would be like had we not done anything or done very little. Um, but I, uh, anyway, so that's that's the challenge, I think. See, to, but to a large extent, but that is that is also the beauty of having such a big world and so many different, uh, you know, points of views uh, that we do basically have this. Actually, we have. You know, little micro experiments going on everywhere. We have, you know, Korea, Taiwan, we have Sweden, we have individual states in the US, each kind of doing their own different thing, their own version of lockdown or, you know, kind of responding to the epidemic. And so, you know, I think at the end of it, we will be able to see like, hey, who had the best outcomes, who had, you know, the fastest, you know, healing rates or, you know, recovery rates or something like this, who had the smallest impact in economy? And uh, what does that mean for the long term? And so I think I think actually in about, you know, 10 years, we will be able to unpack all this and be like, okay, you know, this model was the best. And and, you know, if we had a similar situation in the future, we should, you know, kind of follow this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, you're right about that. I, I, you're right about that. I, I do take that back. I should have expressed that better, but I think you expressed it well, which is there are micro experiments going on. And Sweden, for example, is an interesting one as long as, com- as long as you compare Sweden to other economies and countries around it that have similar culture and setup. And uh, you can't compare Sweden very easily with, let's say, Laos or, I don't know, Cambodia. or <laughs> it's, it's a very different, it, it's, it's a harder comparison, but you can certainly compare it to Denmark and you compare it to Finland and see how they're doing. And, and they're doing, I think, basically anywhere between two to four times more deaths in Sweden, which to me, it's like, okay, but it's, as one person told me, he says, two times a small number is still a small number. (laughs) So, you know, if, if it's, if let's say if Sweden has, I don't know, let's say a thousand deaths, uh, and the other place only had 200 deaths. Okay. It's five times more, which sounds kind of scary, let's say, but it's only a thousand deaths versus, you know, versus, you know, what was the impact it had on shutting down the entire economy? How many more deaths were caused, uh, as a result of that? So, um, yeah, it's 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 something that I think once all the emotion goes away and we start to analyze this a little bit more carefully and run the numbers, 
there'll be a little bit more clarity, but there'll never be 100% clarity or consensus because everybody will run the numbers the way they want to run it to get the answer they want. <laughs> yeah, I very much agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so what's next for you once this uh, quarantine kind of ends? Where do you uh, uh, plan to go? Because I imagine you want to see the, the other countries of the world, or is that not exactly one of your goals? Yeah, so I'm actually kind of done. Um, you know, I don't need to travel anymore. I don't. There, there are definitely places I still want to go, and I, I still believe, you know, this idea. Uh, but I don't. I'm not like, oh, I need to, you know, see all these things because I've, I feel like I've seen, you know, what I needed to see, and, and a lot of it, uh, I've realized is just kind of a rehash of old stuff. Like, you know, went to Peru with my family this, um, you know, Christmas time. And it's just like, well, you know, it's kind of like uh, Ecuador and, you know, uh, Panama and like all these, you know, South American, Central American countries. Like it doesn't, you know, mm -hmm. really change that much. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, you know, as a Thai say, same, same, but different. So I'm actually um, I'm actually going to be starting my Ph.D. here in uh, in August. And uh, in what subject? Uh, electrical engineering and uh, neural implants, brain implants, which is what I'm what I'm studying, like packaging for um, for these, you know for these implants. Oh, wow. Is this kind of in the same realm of Neuralink? Uh, what's his name? Uh, Elon Musk's kind of thing. I mean, it's not that company, but it's in that you're going down that similar path or totally different. Yeah. Yeah. Actually very much so. Uh, so one of the, um, I don't know, founding team of that, uh, which was like eight people or something like this. Uh, I'm, I'm in, you know, pretty decent contact with her and, you know, very much like what she does and, you know, haven't met her in person, but, you know, we've exchanged a good amount of emails. Um, so yeah, very, very much similar to that. And they, their technology is like really, really impressive. I, I would say. What, uh, tell us about it because I know, I know very little. It seems like a very kind of stealthy, uh, startup, at least Elon Musk's. I don't know if the, this lady that you're talking about is working with Elon Musk or is it totally is a competitor? No, yeah, she's she's working with him, and uh, she. So they did a presentation last summer. Uh, you know what was that? I think August, no, July, two thousand nineteen, or something. I don't, I'm not exactly sure, but she she was one of the presenters uh, on that as well. So she was talking about the technology that she had worked on, and basically they're putting like these micro threads into the brain. They're sewing it with like a robotic. Um, sewing machine, you know, kind of this uh, robot that finds, makes sure it doesn't hit blood re blood vessels, you know, using computer vision. And uh, at this size, there is no inflammatory response. So the body doesn't realize that anything's there. And so it just kind of like body doesn't know that anything happened. And um, so, yeah, basically you can send and receive electric signals in this and you can use it to, you know, improve your memory or, uh, you know, send signals to your arms or robotic arms if you're paraplegic or quadriplegic and, um, you know, basically anything that you, you want to do. And it has been a little bit more stealth than, you know, Tesla or, um, you know, SpaceX or something like this. It is a little bit more in its early stages, but uh, I think it's very impressive. And uh, yeah, basically bringing to life brain implants. This is fascinating. It's going to be, uh, I, I do believe, I guess there's three points of view. There's one is that Homo sapiens will still be kind of biological in nature in the next hundred years. Others say that we'll go 100% robotic, 100% Android, 100% and then there's a third camp, I suppose, that says that will be cyborgs. Um, what is your opinion on those three potential? Or will they all three of them coexist with each other? Yeah, I don't know. I would probably say mostly the, the cyborg option. Um, I mean, if you think about it, we kind of already are a little bit. You know, if you have glasses or contact lenses or anything like this, you know, that that's technology that you use to make yourself better, maybe superhuman, you might say. Or hearing aid. He exactly, hearing aid. That, I mean, that, that one's actually electronic. So cochlear implant, you know, that already exists. Or, or um, pacemaker. Pacemaker, exactly. So uh, a lot of this stuff is, a lot of this stuff is actually very much based on pacemaker technology. And it's just, you know, uh, shocking or stimulating the the parts of the body that might have issues or something like this. Even even memory, you know, they, they basically have memory implants where you can you turn it on and you remember everything. Like people people might have like a really you know Alzheimer's or something like this, and then they they turn it on and it's just like oh I'm a normal person again and I don't have to you know I, I don't forget everything. And uh, so it's this kind of stuff. Um, and so I think it is I think it is kind of more like this. Uh, you know, Elon Musk talks about like hey this will be like you know, a third layer on our brain. So everybody's heard about the reptilian brain. This is like, you know, the, the what is it, four Fs, like feed, 
uh, flee, you know, and and then reproduce. <laughs> uh, you can imagine what the, the <laughs> other F is. Um, these are the very basal, you know, needs and, and drives and everything that everybody has. And then, you know, you have the mammalian brain, the, the dog brain almost like, oh, wait, like, look, oh, something shiny or, you know, like, hey, you know, I'm going to get my back scratched or, you know, whatever, a little bit higher level um well, I, I think actually he's saying, okay. And then the third level is kind of the human brain, the, the reasoning and, and, you know, speech and all this kind of stuff that, that was like, oh, I'm a human. And, um, and then I guess, I guess this would be the fourth level uh, and basically be like, you know, the, the computer and uh, super, you know, access to any information or, you know, being, pi- bleh, being part of the AI, being part of, you know, the, the AI that everybody's afraid that's going to take over the world. You're part of that. You're kind of plugged into that and so is everybody else. And so that would be the fourth layer of the brain. And we'd have access to that. I, I think that's uh, I think that's pretty true. I think that's pretty accurate. Um, and you know, we might we might have you know kind of a normal life, but also have it be advanced, almost like with smartphones. Like you know, something's going on you know in the Middle East or something. I know about it instantly, or I can know about it instantly if I choose to. And uh, you know, you're kind of plugged into this worldwide, human wide network. Our path to becoming cyborgs is already started, as you kind of alluded to. What? Did, how do you see? that evolving in this decade versus the next decade in other words what are the first iterations or first goals that Neuralink is going to try to accomplish within this decade and the next one yeah so Neuralink is is pretty good like I've been a bit frustrated with the field because it's been going it's been moving pretty slowly like there hasn't been a lot of progress decade to decade it's not like oh my god like things are so much better um but you know, it's pretty slow moving, but I think it's because you deal with biology and biological samples and all this kind of stuff. And so you have to kind of take away the noise from biology, which is huge, which is absolutely just, you know, that's such a huge mm-hmm. noise. And, you know, you got to you got to separate out uh, what's what's causing what. And you got this biological noise in the in the middle, uh, which really muddles everything. But in terms of what, um, you know, Neuralink wants to do. Uh, they want to, what were they saying? I think, I think by next year, actually, they wanted to do like inhuman studies and, you know, the big, I guess, low hanging fruit or the thing that everybody can agree on is basically giving movement to quadriplegics. So basically, uh, people who can't move their arms and legs, you know, they're paralyzed, uh, basically giving them an implant and they can either move robotic arms or an exoskeleton or they you stimulate their, their hands, uh, with electricity and, uh, they can move their own hands with their thoughts. And so that's kind of the, the direction that they want to go. And, you know, they're, they're saying actually it's going to be in a few years, which would be, you know, amazing because, um, you know, nobody else would, would have it done that fast. But, um, yeah, that, that's kind of the, that's kind of the, um, progress. But a lot of this is, is um, you know, so computationally intensive, like we don't know what's going on. And there's so many degrees of freedom in the brain, even like that's biology times a million, because, you know, the brain is like so con- it's biology. And on top of that biology, there's like all these channels of of neurons, neural pathways, you know, brain cells, what's going on and, and circuits and like what circuit triggers what. And, you know, it's just super complicated. So uh, I think it's going to take a really long time to, to develop. So I think in this next de- decade, which is 2020 to 2030, uh, things are going to be kind of slow moving, but more and more people are going to have it almost like a pacemaker. It's not going to be like completely out of the ordinary to see somebody with it or hear somebody has it. Um, but then, you know, the following decade, it might be actually more used, I don't know about recreationally, but like more for uh, enhancement instead of like, hey, you know, um, f- curing, I guess. What are you working on? on your PhD to get Latin? What's your, your goal? I, I like the, the mechanical side of things. So basically how it is actually in the body and, you know, does it get dissolved or whatever? Does the body try to attack it? And uh, so I really like the idea of, you know, kind of mitigating that as much as possible, reducing that as much as possible. And um, so my project, I'm working on packaging, basically having this interconnect that almost like a plug in a wall, you know, you can unplug it, plug it, unplug it, plug it. And you don't have to like go into the wall and like rip out wires and all this kind of stuff to, to change it, change stuff out. So that's, that's kind of, that's kind of what, what I'm working on is, is almost like a plug, uh, where, you know, you'd be able to remove and, and put in like new, new materials or new, um, uh, I don't know, hardware or something like that. And, um, yeah, so, so I, I want to make it, I don't know, as minimally invasive as possible, I guess. So if Elon Musk said to you, okay, I, you're in charge of this project and pick any project you want along this realm. That's what you would say is I want to have something that's kind of allows to be plug and play for the brain. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's like minimally invasive, like where it's not like, hey, 
uh, you want this done? Okay, I'm going to have to remove your skull, and I'm going to have to do this crazy, crazy stuff. You're going to be like, oh, I don't know about this. Like, this sounds kind of r- like removing my skull, like, and opening up my brain, and like, that doesn't sound that doesn't sound fun. Like, you know, you want it to be as minimally, like, as easy as like you go into a, a clinic and it's just like, oh yeah, you know, almost like getting a tattoo or something like this. Yeah, sure, whatever. I'm going to do it. Maybe you get drunk one day and you're like, oh, I got a neural implant. Like, uh, oh wow, how, what's that like? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think uh, when do you, some people think that it's impossible to back up the brain, that it will just be forever impossible because what makes up the brain is almost like spiritual and some sort of uh, it's it's too tied also with our biological body and you can't separate the two ever. Uh, but others people say, no, that's, you know, kind of like uh, what's this guy's name? The uh, singularity guy. Ray Kurzweil. I'm blanking on it. Ray Kurzweil, thank you, who say, no, 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 in, in a few decades or maybe a century, I don't know what his timeline is, but that we will be able to back up the brain and we will be able to make a copy of our brain so that we can effectively be immortal, at least in silicon. What do you think of in that debate? Yeah, I think, I mean, theoretically it's possible, but at the same time, why? You know, like, I think at some point we're going to get uh, functionally, and, and again, you know, computers are different. Like, computers don't think the way humans do. Computers, like, are really good at some things and really bad at other things. And I think um, we're going to reach a point where just things are so good in certain ways. And, and it doesn't have to recreate a, a mind. Like, you know, when you fly in an airplane, you don't you don't expect it to flap its wings, you know, like, and, and to have mm-hmm. an airplane that flaps its wings would be really weird. And, and that's actually wouldn't be as good as the technology that we have. So I guess it's feasible to have an airplane flap its wings. But but why? Like, if you have such big hits uh, and it's so much more right, expensive. But, but, but you said, why would we want to do it? Like, but it's for immortality. The oldest quest of hom- humanity is to become immortal. So that's why they would want to back up the brain. So I guess what I'm trying to say is if you could achieve the same thing in a different way, uh, would you do that? So basically, I want to get from point A to point B. I want to fly. Uh, do I want a slow plane you know, that goes, I don't know, 50 miles an hour and is really expensive, really big, you know, very complicated machine? And do I go from point A to point B like that? Or do I get into a modern jet that goes 600 miles an hour, carries, you know, thousands of people or hundreds of people and, uh, you know, goes goes much faster and it's cheaper and easier to build and all this kind of stuff. So that's basically what I'm saying is like functionally it could be the same, but I think the way that's going to happen is completely unnatural or un, un, unlike anything that nature has come up with and that it's going to be um, better actually too. Okay. I think I... F- follow what you're saying, but I'm still a bit confused. In other words, I can understand you're saying that the brain that, let's say we want to duplicate your brain. The end product is not going to look like a three pound mushy organic thing that your brain is currently. It's going to be maybe sitting on a hard drive somewhere or <laughs> the equivalent of a hard drive. It's or it's going to be in the cloud or whatever. So it has nothing to do. There's no parallelism with what biological brains look like it doesn't look like one it's sitting there a hard drive doesn't look like a biological brain but in the end it actually is a copy of you so that is that what you're trying to say yeah uh very very similar to that so i would say a big part of our thinking is uh actually determined by emotions and emotions are really just secretions of different you know neurochemicals neuro neurotransmitters you know to put in fear love disgust anger whatever and um you know i I guess a a computer could recreate recreate that but, I mean, it probably wouldn't, you know, obviously wouldn't do that biologically, but, uh, you know, maybe it does include that somehow. But, um, yeah, so so without that, without emotion, honestly, you would be missing a lot of stuff that you would um, have, I don't know, in, in, a, in what you would consider your consciousness, who you consider you, you yourself are. Uh, you wouldn't have a lot of that because of, you know, what was what is intrinsically lacking in the machine. Um so yeah, I mean, I don't well, know. Why like, can't you recreate? Why can't you recreate those secretions? Which I mean, in code, in right? A silicon form, yeah. yeah, in code. I mean, yeah, I guess so. I mean, but then at that point, is like, is that useful? Is it? Is it useful to you know program in blinding rage? <laughs> right. Uh, well, I guess one one aspect is, of course, you could fix these things. But let's say if you just want to make a perfect, like you know, somebody who has been contributing to society is, let's say, you know, Bill Gates. I guess some people don't like Bill Gates, but whatever. You want to just duplicate his brain so that he lives another 1,000 years. Um, I, Bill Gates obviously has many flaws, shortcomings, et cetera. Maybe he has blinding rage. 
when he <laughs> slams his computer. But uh, but in general, uh, there's you take it all in and you just make a, a copy of that. And maybe later on, you can make 100 copies of it. And then each copy you can start to fiddle with and say, okay, let's try to take the blinding rage out of this particular copy. And then, oh, oh shit, that's going to create all sorts of other problems. It's going to create these side effects if we take that. And okay, we'll just delete that brain. We'll start... Uh, doing you know brain number two and start fiddling with that one until you kind of like massage it but the point is is that you have effectively made yourself a mortal yeah i mean i think i think that would be uh possible but and, and you know probable um but you know the question is would you want to do like hey you have an issue with your computer you call him up you call up bill gates and be like hey how do you fix this and then he would go through and like through words explain it and and i don't know that that might not be as efficient as like it just happening or something like this um Again, going back to um, Mike Bown, actually, um, you know, his his uh, book, Living Off the Land, which I don't know when that's going to be coming out. But uh, basically, they do have something. They, they have this like utopia. And, um, you know, then they have uh, like this this um, I don't know, like an energy field or something like this. And that, that's kind of where like the souls go. That, that's where like the knowledge, that's where the collective wisdom goes. And, you know, you have, you know, people living around and people kind of hanging out and they, you know, as they get, you know, initiated into the society, they kind of get dunked into that, you know, collective wisdom and they, they learn all the laws and they learn all the, you know, the background of everything. And so, um, you know, uh, I, I think this is kind of what, it would look like more is you just kind of have this collective wisdom of everybody and then you get dunked into it or you'd, you'd like constantly have access to it. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if it would be necessary to, you know, I mean, and then at that point you could probably keep somebody alive uh, functionally. You could just, you know, replace out broken parts, almost like on a car. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, like uh, it, it's, it's a, uh, it's, you know, it's science fiction at, at this point, like people don't know what it's going to look like, but I have a feeling that it's going to be like the plane where it's going to be like, okay, we want to fly and it's not going to look anything like nature. Like we don't have any flapping airplanes and um, right. it's going to be, it's going to be more or the like a car. For example, yeah. it's like, instead of having a horse, you have a car, exactly. which doesn't look like a horse. <laughs> and it's only now that we're making like dog shaped, you know, Boston, Boston dynamics is linking like dog things, dog right. robots. And those are significantly more expensive, significantly more uh, detailed or advanced than it is to have a car. Right, and a dishwash, uh, dishwashing machine doesn't look like an actual human dishwasher. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but the Ibo robot from Sony looks it. Anyway, fascinating discussion. Oh, I wish you the best. When are you going to be finishing up your PhD? Uh, yeah, so I'll be starting now, and uh, usually it takes you know three to six years or whatever. But uh, I have been working in this lab for you know uh, it will have been a year, and I was working in another lab across the street for a year, and I already have a master's, so I hope it could be done really fast. So on the lower end of that, so maybe even like three years, uh, we'll see. But you know, I'm, I'm doing other projects you, in the meantime. Are you working at the same time? What's that? You're working at the same time. I'm working in the lab, so like I get paid to do research as well. So, and it's essentially the the like the the role that I've been doing up until now. But now, as a PhD student, I'll be taking classes also, and you know, having a little bit more responsibility with projects and stuff like that. But uh, essentially, what I've been doing up until now. So while you're doing the PhD, your work and the PhD kind of merge into kind of one. In exactly. That kind of sense. Exactly. I imagine there's bills to pay, but does the company then pay for your tuition? Yeah, so the professor actually uh, he pays for it uh, through grants, through projects, and uh, yeah, he pays for the tuition and you know a, a stipend, a salary, um, which isn't much, but you know still it's better than nothing. That's sweet. That's actually kind of a great deal. Yeah. Uh, after a few years, yeah, it's pretty sweet. I mean, I've always wondered like how the hell does somebody get like a history PhD? I mean, it costs money, but I guess most people who are pursuing PhDs, academic PhDs eventually get some sort of funding because otherwise it's sometimes hard to justify. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you can always kind of pay your way uh, to do that. You know, pay for a PhD, I guess. And I think that's a lot of how the history, you know, history ones do that. And so they might take actual loans because, you know, there's less funding, less grants in that. But, uh, you know, I'm I'm in a pretty lucrative field and they have money and we have really nice resources. So, uh, you know, the, the history people, they're kind of in shabby, you know, 100-year-old buildings and I'm in a brand new 10-year-old building and, and uh, have lots of shiny equipment around me. 
Ladan, I wish you the best, and thank you so much for being on the Wonder Learn podcast. Where can people learn more about you? You know, I talk about the travel, uh, travel wisdom, everything on Travel Wisdom Podcast. You can find me there. And then, you know, if you like this neural implant stuff, I actually have a neural implant podcast as well. It's called Neural Implant Podcast, and I interview the uh, leaders in the field, and, and so you can kind of get a more granular, zoomed-in approach, zoomed-in view of what's going on. And uh, I was actually using it to find my PhD, uh, to find the perfect PhD, you know, professor. So I was interviewing them for the position and it, you know, it worked actually. And I found exactly what I was looking for. <laughs> I am definitely going to subscribe to that, uh, that uh, brain podcast. Can you repeat it one more time? Uh, neural implant podcast. I'm definitely, I'm subscribing right now. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. See ya. And that concludes this episode of the Wander Learn podcast, where we explore travel, technology, and transformation. If you'd like to see the show notes with links to what we talked about, or if you'd like to comment on the show, or if you'd like to ask me a question, then go to wanderlearn.com and click on this episode. If you'd like to connect with me, just remember FTAPON. That's my first initial and my last name. FTAPON is the username I use on all social media. You can also get to my website by going to ftapon.com. And here's one last reason to remember FTAPON. If you like what I do and would like to get rewarded for supporting my projects, then go to patreon.com slash FTAPON. That's where you can pick up some remarkable rewards for as little as $2 a month. And now for five quick favors. Number one, subscribe to the Wander Learn podcast. Two, download it. Three, share it. Four, review it somewhere. And five, sign up for my newsletter at wanderlearn.com. Our theme music was composed by Eric Stratman. This is Francis Tapon encouraging you to wander and learn.